Hi, Asaf, welcome. Atasha, may I Yes, can you hear me? Can, can, meule. Okay. As any machli fout hali out a host? Yeshra nisayan bizum? Can. Meule. As a zakfarit hill la clit is a call, at a host, veberia shetarotella shepherd, the shepherd the massach, at a betsem machli for tea, the massach. Is that it? אוקיי, מעולה. יאללה, אני מוציאה את הדוח, שנייה. אוקיי, okay, יש לך אחד, שתיים, שלוש, ארבע, חמש, שש, שבע אנשים. אוקיי. תודה לך? יאללה, בהצלחה, אני כאן. תודה. בסדר, אני בדיוק הולך להתחיל הרצאה. אני יכול לדבר איתך עוד איזה שעה? Thank you. 
Hello, Bella. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Where are you now? I mean. Hello, Bella. Uh, Rochelle? Hi. Hey, Rochelle, what's up? Hey. Uh, do you want to wait for a few more minutes? I would, I would. Um, yeah, I would. Wait another five minutes and let's see. Cool. All right, so in 3.05, I'll start. Maybe it'll be just like a very, very uh, small audience. I hope not. Um, mo you know, Kulam, everyone has has shown up for all of these, um, but they do okay, come in cool. a little bit late. Sometimes people okay. have some issues technically. All right, cool. Okay, we have another one. Welcome. Hey. Hey, Rebecca. Hi there. <laughs> What's up? Uh, nothing much. All good. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> where are you? Where are you now? 
Um, I'm on the um, Way More Israel program at Heritage House, living in the old city of Jerusalem. I was interning at Yav Hashem until they um, had shut their doors. So I've been attending a few of the Masa webinars here and there. Oh, the old city right now, I imagine it's a pretty surreal sight. It's very empty. I've never seen it like this. No tourists. It's and so many of the shops are shut down because of the restrictions. Okay, so we have Rebecca, Bella, and Layla. Layla, how are you? Layla. Hey, Layla, what's up? Uh, do you want me to? Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and unmute you. Hey, Layla, how are you? All right, everyone, we're going to start in about two minutes and hopefully we'll have a wonderful time. Uh, I'm just going to wait two more minutes to see if anyone else joins us. All right. Okay, everyone, it's 3.05, so I am going to start. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment, and I'm just going to say hi. Ah, oh, there I am. Okay. Hi. If you want to have a face to the voice that's going to be talking for the next 45 minutes to an hour, hi, how are you? Uh, my name is Asaf Gamzu. Uh, I'm currently the Director of Museum Education at the Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv. Before that, I was curator at the Israeli Cartoon Museum, a small and lovely museum uh, in Hulon, if you know it, it's south of Tel Aviv. I'm now at home at my balcony. I have a partner, two kids, a cat, a dragon, so I thought it'd be best to do this from the balcony. If you hear chirping, and other noises, I apologize, but we're gonna try and make the best of the situation, um, which is, you know, the, the motto of the past uh, few weeks. Okay, uh, so we're starting now, and basically, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're gonna to talk about 
pop culture revolutions, their heroes, and what they tell us about ourselves. What I mean to say in that headline is we're, we're going to try and see what we can learn uh, specifically about the Jewish American community from a very weird historical phenomenon. Um, for the past hundred years or so, uh, American Jews have really dominated major aspects of cultural production in America. I'm thinking about Broadway, uh, TV, cinema, public radio, and, and comic books. And we're going to be talking about comic books. And, uh, and one of the things that many people want to say is, oh, awesome, you know, Jewish culture is great, Jews are great, and everything is Jewish. And that is kind of true, but also not always true. I mean, is everything, you know, does everything Bob Dylan write Jewish? I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, but um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at the cultural revolutions that Jews, the Jewish creative people have made in the comic book industry. And we're going to try and do the reverse. Instead of appropriating it and say, hey, it's so Jewish, we're Jewish, it's awesome, which is also great. But we're going to try and see what we can learn about the Jewish community through those cultural heroes that they made, right? Because when we make a work of art, of course, it's a product of who we are. And so we can learn about the Jewish community through that. Now that I've finished the intro, uh, I just want to check that you're all with me. Now you can all raise your hands if you have a question and you can all use your chat. So I just want to check, uh, is everyone okay? Is everyone with me? You can just write yes in the chat. Yes, thank you, Vladi. Yes, hi, Leila. So happy. Rebecca, hi. Okay, so we have Vladi, Rebecca, Bella. Okay, yes, wonderful. And all right, great. Okay, so we have everyone. Oh, we have two Bellas. How lovely. Okay, so I'm waiting for the second Bella. If she would be so pleased, just to be sure that you're with me. Okay, if you have any question, just be free, just feel free to write it in the chat. I used to teach in Israeli classrooms, and you can imagine I am very, very used to uh, the mess that that entails. Okay, great. All right, so what are we? Okay. Uh, I think that, I think we covered this. Okay, so let's start with a classic story. It's the story of a child born in a time of peril. His parents were worried about him and so they sent him far away. He was adopted by a family and when he grew up, because of this sort of mixed, mixed origin, he could become a hero and save his people. I am, of course, talking about Superman. Now, as I, you see, I did a trick there. You th uh, I hope you thought I was talking about Moses. If you didn't think I was talking about Moses, then please think I was talking about Moses. Um, but actually, when we look at it, we see that the story of Superman and the story of Moses are basically the same, right? They're both born in time of Pharaoh. Moses is born while Pharaoh, while the Jews are slaves in Egypt, and Pharaoh says yeah, all, uh, ma all male Israelite uh, babies should be thrown to the Nile, and Superman is born when his whole planet, Krypton, is about to explode. And so his parents and Moses' parents decide to put him in a, in a small, in a little ark uh, in the Niles or a little spaceship that will take, them, take him across the stars uh, and bring him to a better place. Either Pharaoh's, either Pharaoh's palace, or the, or the the home of the Kent family in in Kansas, and there they grow up. And once they realize their origins, it is actually their mixed origins that allow them to be a hero. Right? Moses can go to Pharaoh and tell him to send his people, let his people go, because Moses grew up in the palace, so he knows Egyptian. Uh, he has, you know, when he walks into the palace, he feels at home, literally. He's home, that's where he grew up. But he's also the son of slaves. And in the same sense, 
Superman is a Kryptonian, so he has power and he has super strength and super speed and he can shoot lasers from his eyes like all, apparently all Kryptonians can. Um, but he also has a set of American values and that, and that is why he can be a hero. One of them, it was, if it was just a regular Clark Kent, he couldn't be a hero. If it was just a Kryptonian, he couldn't be a hero. You need that mixed bag, right? And so we see this, we, we see this person, this first superhero, Superman, who very much resembles Moses. Now, this is interesting because he was created by two Jewish kids in Cleveland, Ohio, by Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel, who we saw right here. If you see my marker, these are the kids. They thought of Superman when they were 14. They managed to get a publisher when they were 18. Here, they're in their early 20s, very successful uh, young, young entrepreneurs and creative people who have basically created a genre, created the superhero genre. Uh, and to understand how they succeeded, you need to take a look at comics in general, right? So they were kids, they grew up on comics, and they really, really wanted to get into comics, but they couldn't. Why couldn't they? Well, to understand why they couldn't, we need to, to go back to America in the 1920s and 30s. America in the 1920s and 30s is a hostile place to, uh, to Jewish people, to Irish people. Um, it, America received many, 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 many uh, immigrants from Ireland and from, uh, and from the Pale of Settlement. Uh, Poles, Irish, Jews, and xenophobia levels at that stage in America are sky high, uh, regretfully uh, kind of where they are today, to be honest. And so when young Jewish people want to get into industries, they, they're just being told no. Now this is important because you see to your left the way this beautiful, beautiful pa uh, panel, uh, this beautiful half page, uh, is from Nimoy in the slumber in Slumberland, a beautiful comic made in 1920s. And in the 1920s, uh, comics were very va were a valued piece of art. They were part of newspapers. They were beginning to be very established. You can see they're beautiful, and there there is a lot of artistic craft there. Uh, and when Jews wanted to, to get into, let's say, the New York Times or the Washington Post, maybe it would be more accurate, or other major newspapers, it doesn't really matter which, I'm not, I'm not trying to slander anyone, um, they were just told, no, we're not looking for anyone. We're not looking for new reporters. We're not looking for new artists, etc. cetera. Uh, and and t the key to understanding why uh, Jewish people are so are such a dominant cultural form in America today is to understand what happened then, because what happened is uh, WASP America, white Anglo-Saxon Anglo Protestant America, tells the Jews, no, you can't come here, you can't join the club, and so what what Jewish people are able to do because there are, there's a lot of also a new technology at the time is just that you know what, fine, I'm going to start my own club. So if they're not accepted into the theater, they say, fine, you know what, I'm going to do musicals, which you think is not as good, but I'm fine with it. I'm just going to do musicals. And if they're not accepted into the big studios, they say, fine, you know what, we're just going to go make our own studios and we're going to do cinema. You don't know what cinema is. We're going to do cinema. And so they go and they establish Hollywood. Uh, so that's how Hollywood and Broadway and these uh, industries are established. And that's also how the comic industry is established because at first comics are only the newspapers. They are treated well there. They are printed beautifully there. You can see more examples here of George Harriman. Just see, you know, this is uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland. I'm sorry by Windsor McKay. And here is George Harriman. And look how beautiful it is, how whimsical, how different than the way we see comic books today. And that is the way uh, comics looks at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, but then, you know, Jewish people say, specific people um, say, okay, you know what, fine, if you don't want us, we'll just make our own. And so they make their own. And here you see one panel from Batman. Now you see it's, it's not as 
it's not as, as, as artistically beautiful. It's not that beautifully printed or rendered, but, but it, is, it is a new genre. They did invent something just because they were not allowed in the club, but they had the technological opportunity to make a club of their own. And that is how comics and Broadway and, and Hollywood are born, right? And it is from that um, soup of rejection and possibility that Superman and the superhero genre are born, right? So before we, we move ahead, and of course we have a lot more to cover, I just wanna make sure that we're all good. So I'm just going to unmute you all for one minute. And if you have a question, please let me know. Okay, here you are. You're all unmuted. How are you? Wait a minute, you know what? I'm gonna mute you all again, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have a question. You may be doing whatever you're doing, which is completely fine. I don't wanna bother you while you're you know, eating or whatever, but if you have a question, so far, do you have any question? Are you okay? All right, great. Okay, so we've we come to our first revolution, the superhero. He's first written and drawn 1934 when they're 14. Uh, is this being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. Any more questions? Thank you, Bella. Okay. Uh, published in comic book format in 1938, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel. Now, in the last 15 years, there's been a lot of different academics and publications that say, oh my God, this is amazing, two Jewish people made Superman, so he's a Jewish hero, right? We have From Krakow to Krypton, we have Men of Tomorrow, which is a very recommended book, disguised as Clark Kent, right? And not only that, but Superman is also the first of many, many superheroes created by Jews. Batman, Spider-Man, Captain America, Fantastic Four, Hulk Four. So the question is, are they all Jewish heroes? Uh, and to answer that, we're gonna do a bit of folklore analysis, all right? So this is Superman biography. We've said it a few times already, all right? This is it, but this is also other people's, other heroes, same biography. Not just Moses, but also Gilgamesh uh, from Babylon, Hercules from Greek, Oedipus, Samuel the prophet, and Jesus. Right? So, so what's happening here? Is really Superman Moses? For that, we need to go archetypical, all right? Now we're going to go into the myth of the hero, which was formulated by Otto Rank, a famous scholar of uh, a famous scholar of folklore in 1909. Maybe some of you have heard about the book *The Hero with a Thousand Faces* by Joseph Campbell. It came out in the 1960s, and it's basically um, uh, a rearticulation and of, of those same themes. Right? Uh, and basically, what you do in folklore analysis is what Otto Rank found is that. In myths around the world, you see the same structure for the story of the hero. And so if you want to investigate a culture as a folklorist, what you would do is you take those structures and you see what's edited in and what's edited out. What did that culture do? And then you can understand a lot about the culture from what they did to that basic structure, which is, this, which is many times the same throughout very different uh, human cultures. All right, so let's review the myth of the birth of the hero from 1909. So we have a child of nobility. We have a difficult or forbidden pregnancy. The birth threatens the father. There is an order to, to kill the child from the father or a proxy. The child is sent away, many times in an ark, across an ocean, sea, or river. The child is rescued and raised by animals or a poor family. And upon reaching adulthood or adolescence, he discovers his origins and reclaims his position, usually a king. Let's see how this works out with Moses. So the interesting thing is Moses isn't the child of nobility. It's actually the other way around. Moses is the child of slaves, and he's not raised by a poor family, but he's raised by the family, right? By Pharaoh's family. The birth doesn't threaten the father, but it does threaten Pharaoh, which is kind of uh, 
the father proxy for that matter. He is sent uh, in an ark across a river, across the Nile River, and he's rescued uh, and raised by, as we said, the wealthiest family of them all. And then upon reaching adulthood or adolescence, he discovers his origin and reclaims his position. And that is actually where we meet Moses. We meet Moses as a child, as a baby, and then as an adult, when he sees his brothers, and in the Bible, they're already said to be his brothers. Moses saw his Hebrew brothers, right? So he already knows that he is Hebrew as well. He sees a slave being beaten by, uh, by, by an Egyptian, and he kills the Egyptian and wanders off into the desert where he will uh, where he will get his mission from God, come back and reclaim his position, not exactly of king, but of the leader of the Jews, uh, to be honest, for all eternity. And to this day, Moses is considered the prophet of all prophets uh, in, in, Jewish, uh, in Jewish tradition. And so that's Moses. So now let's see what we can say. How does Superman look, right? Okay. So Superman is kind of a child of nobility. I mean, he's a child of like an advanced alien race. Let's, let's call it sci-fi nobility. We don't have any idea of any difficult or forbidden pregnancy. We don't know uh, in the original story of any sort of threat to the father, but he is sent away in a spaceship across, across the stars, which might as well be an ocean. He is rescued and raised by a poor family. The Kents are a poor family, and that is told and retold and every time the story of Superman is retold. And upon reaching adulthood, he discovers his origin. But this is something interesting. He cannot reclaim his position. Why cannot he reclaim his position? Because of the simple fact that Krypton was destroyed. And so what can we learn from that about the people who created the story? And what I would like to suggest is that what we can learn from that is that Superman is an immigrant hero and that he reflects the dilemmas of second generation immigrants, which are exactly what, who Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel were. Now, they were both young kids. Uh, when they thought of this, they were 14, one year after their bar mitzvah. We don't know how close they were to their uh, Russian Jewish origins, but even if let's say they would want to go back to, I'm sorry, to Russia or Poland, they just couldn't. They couldn't because it's, 19, it's 1930s Europe and no one should go back to Poland or Russia, but they also couldn't because while they're being treated as aliens, as foreigners in America, and being called Jews and Poles and Ruskies and go back to where you came from. It's also very clear, I think, uh, that if they would go back to their Krypton, quote unquote, there they would be called foreigners as well, right? They would be called Americans uh, or maybe uh, anti-Semitic slurs as well. I'm, I don't know, but the point is that they're stuck between worlds, very much like Superman. And so Superman is a reflection of that second generation dilemma of a people whose parents are very much from the old country. They want to be, they, the kids, the second generation person, wants to be part of the new, of the new place, wants to be part of where he grew up. Most uh, second generation immigrants are born or, or, grow, or grow up in, their, in the new country, quote unquote but they're not always allowed to do so. But also they cannot go back. And so Superman is a reflection of that, right? And you can see, you can see what I mean, that in a few, a few years ago, Jean Luniang, who is, uh, who is a, an amazing graphic novelist, graphic novel writer and artist, he won the MacArthur Genius Grant a few years ago. He got to, uh, to um, to write for Superman. And they asked him, well, how do you, is, is it someone you, you aspire to? Because he was a sort of an indie, indie graphic novel sort of, uh, sort of guy. And said, yeah, one of my connection points into Superman is that whole idea that he's an immigrant, right? And Jin Yun Lang became famous for writing about his own experiences as a second generation 
uh, immigrant American, in, in this case, an Asian American, whose parents came from China, and now he's, he grows up in the US, uh, and he has basically the same dilemma that those kids almost 100 years ago had, and now he's writing their story. Okay. Uh, but this also means that Superman is very much an immigrant hero, but I'm not so sure uh, he's a very Jewish hero. Right? I'm sure he's an immigrant hero. I'm, I'm not so sure he's that Jewish. Okay? Before we move on, do you have any thoughts or questions? Anything you'd like to ask? Okay. Got my sip of coffee, so I'm, I'm moving on, if I may. Okay. So... Now we get to, uh, to another thing, which I, I think actually may be more um, uh, a more traditional part of Jewish identity. And that is the notion of the split identity of the super superhero. Now, there's something very interesting about Superman. Usually, in every other superhero, their identity is their regular pedestrian everyday identity and then they dress up as something else. Batman is Bruce Wayne, and one day he decided he wanted to be Batman, and so he does the rational thing all of us do, and he dresses up in gray spandex and goes out at night to fight crime. Um, but, but he is Bruce Wayne. In Superman, that's the reverse. Superman is really Kal-El, a Kryptonian uh, who wears blue and uh, blue and red spandex that's how they 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 garb themselves in krypton and he doesn't dress up as a superhero he dresses up as a regular person he masquerades as clark kent he hides as a reporter to be part of the world that is very very much the experience of an of an immigrant Right? The reality is he's an alien, and that is what you would call an immigrant legally in the U.S. He's an alien, and he has to hide it in order to be part of everyday U.S. society. But that has also been the case for Jews who wanted to participate in society ever since modern times and ever since, the, uh, ever since emancipation came in Europe. When Jews were told, it's, uh, you know, you don't need to hide anymore, just come and be French, be German, be British, uh, whatever. But what happened if you still wanted to be Jewish, right? So you had a conflict. You, you, had, you wanted to be part and contribute to society, but society does not necessarily always want you on your terms. So the solution is to split your identity. And already in the 19th century, almost 100 years before Superman, we have this famous saying, uh, here I put it, Yudale Godon. sometimes it is ascribed to Moses Mendelssohn, um, the famous German Jewish philosopher, but the saying is the same one. It's saying, be a man in the street and a Jew at home. And here we see something that correlates between the immigrant experience, but also the, the modern Jewish experience of what does it mean to be part of society and what does it mean to be Jewish, right? Uh, there's a joke, uh, a plane is being hijacked and a terrorist comes onto the plane and says, uh, and says, uh, who's Jewish? And so a person in the back says, well, that's an interesting question, right? Because that's the question. And how can you be Jewish and participate in modern society? And so, uh, and that becomes integrated into one of the very, very fundamental aspects of the superhero. Right? That notion of I am one person inside my home or to myself, and I'm another person outside in society. And here in another one of my lectures, someone pointed out something beautiful, that the only place where Superman is at home, quote unquote, is in this sort of room that he builds for himself in Antarctica, uh, where he has... Uh, recreated a Kryptonian home, and it's called the Fortress of Solitude. Just think what a powerful symbol that is of, of that immigrant experience of being lonely, right? It's a fortress, it's very powerful, but it's a fortress of solitude. 
because he can only be there by himself. All right, now we come to the first ever Action Comics, the first ever publication of Superman. Uh, I was a comic book geek for many, 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 many years, but because I'm not a millionaire, I could not read this until the invention of the internet and even more of, of comics digitization. A few years ago, this came out uh, for $2 on uh, digital media, and I was very, very happy to buy it. Okay, so what do we have in Action Comics number one? Uh, here, they tell us about how great he is and how wonderful he is, basically where he came from and how powerful he is. But, and then we jump straight into adventures. Now, if I may, I'm just going to tell you what the first adventures are. So the first time we meet Superman, he's not battling robots or aliens or giant monsters. What is he doing? He's saving an innocent man from a death sentence by breaking into the governor's mansion and forcing him to call the prison and stave off the death sentence. He saves a woman from an abusive husband. This is 1938, written by two kids. Yeah, I wanna point that out because uh, violence inside the home is still very much a problem around the world. And almost 100 years ago, these two kids thought the first thing or the second thing a superhero should do is save a woman from an abusive husband. He saves Lois Lane from gangsters. And in the last story in the issue, he holds a corrupt senator over Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. and demands that he uh, let him know how, where is he using the money, what is he doing with it. So we have here something very interesting. Basically, we have a superhero that is very much a progressive, a progressive activist, right? He's not about, uh, he's not about, uh, again, robots uh, or, uh, or aliens. He's about making society better. He is uh, a social justice, a social justice activist, a social justice warrior. I'm sorry, that's the term today in the States. And that is who Superman is when we first meet him. No lasers, no ice, no funny business. Basically just a person who uses his powers to make the world a better place. And that is also something that is very much a part of the Jewish immigrant identity at the time, all right? So, so I'm gonna try and sum up who is Superman and how Jewish or non-Jewish is he, okay? So first of all, Superman is very much a product of 1930s American Jews. He's an immigrant, he has a split identity, and he's all about social justice, right? He votes Democrat, he's all about making better, making better, the New Deal, Roosevelt's New Deal, um, et cetera. But also we should, we should see that Superman is like the, the best projection of what a person can be. He's handsome, he's smart, he's, um, He's, he's, he's the best there could be. And that is also because he was created by a minority that wants to be accepted uh, by society, but in order to be accepted, has to hide itself and has to hide parts of, it, of its identity. And in that sense, it's something very Jewish, but also not necessarily Jewish. It could be any minority. And I can think even of, um, of people in, in Israeli society uh, or in American society today that are uh, forced to do the same thing, um, be they whatever minority they are, uh, uh, LGBTQ, uh, uh, race, religion, creed, whatever, okay? Uh, and in order to be accepted that the, uh, the person has to hide certain aspects of him or herself, right? Uh, and basically we see that this projection of, of American Jewish and American immigrant dilemmas made this new genre that is the superhero that became one of the definition of American culture, superhero. Now, many people ask me, why is there no Israeli superhero? And my answer to that, there is also no French superhero and no uh, Japanese superhero. There are people with powers, but they're not superheroes. They're not... 
this sort of uh, combination of a split identity and fighting for social justice and having power, that's something unique to America. And I think that's unique because of, uh, of America's perception of itself as an immigrant culture. And that is how this superhero can be invented by two Jewish children in the 1930s and be written by a Chinese American person in the 21st century, because that is the same dilemma. They're facing the same quandaries years and years apart. Okay? Now, uh, before we move on to the second cultural revolution, do you have any thoughts or questions? I would really love you know, for you to, to know if you have anything you'd want to say or add or ask me. Oh, okay. So I'm assuming, yes, is there someone here? Yeah, I guess I'll speak for a second. That this is really fascinating that I never knew this is how Superman first started since we are so used to him battling other aliens using his heat ray, but to see him fight really just us. So this is all really fascinating and this is something I never knew about Superman. I'm so happy. Do, do you have any question or you just wanted to, because that's great, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> do you have any question or is that at all? No. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, Rebecca. It really means a lot. So I'm just going to move on to, uh, to the second cultural revolution. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to see what happens when sometimes those exact same people, now years have gone by, and basically uh, the American Jewish community or the Jewish American community has really changed a lot. And the same people that invented the comic book, right? The Jews invented the comic book when they were not allowed to write and draw for the funny pages in the, in the, in the major newspapers of New York. So they inv in, in invent this sort of cheap um, a nickel, a nickel and dime solution of a comic book for children. But then years go by, it's already the 1970s and 80s, and, and, and that community and America have, have different needs, right? So Will Eisner in 1978 publishes a, a graphic novel. Now what's a graphic novel? A graphic novel is a comic book who had the bar mitzvah and wants to be taken seriously, right? A graphic novel is, is, is just comics, but in a book form. There is nothing quintessentially different. You just the graphic novel is what comics pretend to be when they want to be taken seriously. Uh, for adults, uh, adult themes, whatever, but, but the form, the art is the same art. And so Will Eisner, Will Eisner was one of the founders of the comic book industry back in the 1930s, the time of the superhero we were just at. He was a very good businessman. Uh, he basically invented the method of, if you know comics, of, uh, of, uh, of breaking down the art into a pencil or ink or letterer, right? And he did that in his studio so that it would never be dependent on one artist. So that if our one artist got sick or got fired or another studio took him, he could just replace him with another one. And he made uh, the art of comics into a factory. But after the war, after the Second World War, he retired from comics. He had a, he had a very successful graphics company. Uh, and in the, in an early 1970s, I think 1972 or three, but I'm not sure about the exact year, his daughter dies. And, and when his daughter dies, he goes back into comics. He was always a very, very, very talented artist. He goes back into comics, but now not as a businessman, but, but as a means to, to tell a story, as a means to express his anguish. Uh, and what comes out is the first graphic novel. I, would, I need to say there are a few titles that uh, different researchers will say, this is the first graphic novel, that is the first graphic novel. I'm gonna talk about other books as well as we go on with the, with the, with the lecture. And, and, and it doesn't really matter if this is the first one or, or another one you know, got published two years before or after. That, that's not the point. The point is to see what these works of art do now with notions of identity that we saw in Superman. So, and in the superhero genre. Um, so if before 
Jews were not, not allowed into the, the major newspapers, and so they had to invent the comic book. Now Will Eisner has a book, and he tries to go to the major publishers, book publishers, and say, hey, I want to publish this. And they say, but we don't publish comic books. So he says, no, no, it's not a comic book. It's a graphic novel, right? He invents this term as a pitching way for, um, for his dealings with, with the publishers for trying to get it published, and he does manage to get it published. Now, but what is the book about? The book is about Fri Hirsch, who is an immigrant Jew. Here I wrote from Brooklyn, but of course before that he's from Russia. And we meet uh, Fri when he's coming back from his adopted daughter's funeral. Comes back, he steps up the stairs of his tenement where he's the super, and he cries out to God that they have a contract and you can't do that to me. While the storm is raging outside, the whole tenement shakes with the shouts and commendations of the freemen. Because what we realize is that uh, back in the old country, before traveling to the Golden, to the Golden Medina, to America, freemen like Jacob in the Bible made a contract with God. And the contract was very simple. It was the simple Jewish religious contract. For, for the believing among the Jewish community. Uh, and, 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 and basically for many other religions as well. I will do what you tell me. I will be a good person and I will keep the religious mitzvahs, the religious laws. And in return, I will have a decent life. Not necessarily prosper or be very successful, just, just a decent life. And uh, and when his adopted daughter dies, Freeman renounces the contract and tells God that God voided their contract, right? He, he was a decent person. He did no one no wrong. And then his daughter died, which is an unbelievable tragedy. And so after renouncing his contract, he goes and he does everything you can think about, which is the worst stereotypes about Jews uh, ever in history, but also specifically in American society. He goes and he takes a loan against the tenement, which he doesn't own, he's a super, and then he becomes a loan shark, and then he becomes richer and richer and richer, and he doesn't care about anyone. He marries a non-Jew, and he has another mistress, uh, which is also, Non-Jew, he's basically, he's basically an anti-Semitic uh, cartoon. And at the height of his power, he gets three rabbis in a room and he tells them the story of his life. And he tells them, I want you to write me a new contract, you're rabbis, and I want you to write me a new contract. In this contract, God will not be able to void, right? The amazing thing here is that this is not an atheist work of art. This is actually a very religious work of art, but it's, uh, uh, but the, the person who might void the contract is not man, but in this case, God. And this actually harkens back to the Bible, where if we read the book of Job, and uh, if we read Abraham's stories in, in Genesis, not Jacob, Jacob is, is a prankster, and, uh, uh, but, but Abraham's stories, we see that, that they have the same claims, right? So the book ends with Freeman coming to sign the new contract. And then he is, uh, lightning strikes the tenement and, uh, and he gets a stroke. He gets, I'm sorry, a heart attack and he dies at the spot. And what's very interesting about this ending is that we're not sure why, why he died. Uh, if we want to ascribe his death to God, then we're still left with two possibilities, that either he died because he, you know, he shouldn't have done it. He shouldn't have, uh, have talked to God as a chutzuf. He shouldn't have had so much chutzpah. He should have been more respectful to God. But another option is to say that maybe God did not want to sign a contract which he could not get out of, right? That maybe indeed God is the weaker side here. So, that is a very, very, very powerful piece of art. I just want to show you the art again. Also, just to see the talent of Will Eisner, 
to this day, if, you, if you're comic book fans, you know, the Eisner Awards, the, the Oscars in the comic book industry, which are named after him. Uh, and, and, and you can see the powerful work it did, which also has a lot of, of, of religious um, baggage and, and a very strong message. And I really urge you, if you're at all interested in what I'm saying, if you're curious, to go out and, and read this. Um, I'm sorry, don't go out, but, uh, but order this or read this when you get the chance, when, when this whole thing hopefully blows over quickly. So, so that, is one, that is one piece of work that I want us to keep in mind. Then we have another, the second first graphic novel, right? This is another piece of work that is also said to be the first graphic novel. That is not the point of, of who was the first graphic novel. The point is, let's see what happens. Because at the same time, in the late 1970s, while at one part of New York, uh, I think Long Island, you know, more upscale, Will Eisner is working on his book. In another part of the state of New York, in Manhattan, uh, Art Spiegelman is also working on what he thinks is a brand new invention of make, making comics into a book. Now, what is he doing? What is he doing? He, he basically makes uh, mouse, which is basically testimony, Holocaust testimony, turned into a comic book. Art Spiegelman is second generation immigrant, like Will Eisner. He was born in the States, like Eisner. But his parents, his father is a Holocaust survivor. Both his parents are um, Auschwitz survivors. And Mass is the story of his father, Vladek, from, from the days of his youth and his young uh, adulthood um, up until the present day, through, of course, Auschwitz. And Mass is, is a masterpiece of comic book work. And it really manages to break the, ar to break the barriers, which, which Contract of God didn't. It manages to break the barriers and make itself known to the wider public. And it receives a special Pulitzer Prize um, just for its sheer mastery of the, of the form and of the form of story. Um, and, and, and there are a lot of similarities between both creators also in their, in their aim. They both say they wanted to make comics something like a book, something you had to, to leave through. This is actually something they both said almost in the exact same words in different interviews they had. Now let's see what what we have here. So you can, you can see it's very graphic and it deals with notions of identity. And like, like with Eisner, it's unafraid to touch upon explicitly anti-Semitic tropes. In this case, turning Jews into mice, into vermin, which is what Nazi propaganda did. Right, but Art Spiegelman does a very nuanced uh, use of that when he when he has this discussion about how war, and specifically the Second World War, and specifically the Holocaust, made everyone the same. Right. So here to the right, I have a panel, I have two panels from a story that uh, Vladek tells Art about. About, uh, about a prisoner in Auschwitz, right? So he's a Jew, he's a mouse, but he says, no, I'm not a Jew, I'm a German. And Germans in mouse are depicted as cats. Now, of course, this is, this is a farce. This is the artist telling us that he knows that, that that's not how identity works. You can't really see if someone is Jewish, German, Russian, Polish, American, or whatever. Right? And that attempt by Nazi propaganda is, is a failure. Right? And he showed this to us in this story of, of, of a missed identity. And how do, you, how do you draw, how do you mark one's identity right? with identity being so ephemeral? And here we see Art Spiegelman drawing himself, but with the, uh, the mouse as a mask. Here he is a mouse, but here it's drawn as a mask because he's having doubts about his project because his father died, but, but the first book has become very successful. So a very, very, very powerful work. It, it received a special culture prize. It was translated to really, I don't know how many languages taught all over the world. 
And so what, what can we say about both of these graphic novels? And also, uh, we want to start closing up. First of all, I want us to think about how different they are from comic books. They're serious art, they're serious artwork, but, but also I want us to look at how different they are in how they think of themselves. So first of all, they don't hide any part of their creator's identity. There's no split identity here. They are Jewish immigrants talking about Jewish themes. I'm sorry, just a sec. That was a deliberate guys, if you imagine. They're talking about very Jewish themes. They're talking about immigration, about the Holocaust, about the Bible, about faith, about anti-Semitism. Those are all explicitly Jewish themes that the, the creators of the superhero genre avoided at all costs. And that includes Will Eisner himself, who drew comics in that same time and didn't touch, about, touch upon any of those themes. They both deal with their father's generation. And not only that, and this is very important, their heroes are very, very flawed. Vladek, the Holocaust survivor, is a cheap, pedantic racist. And it's very hard to emphasize with him. And, and, uh, and Freeman, as I said, is very much the, the embodiment of the anti-Semitic uh, cartoon, right? And at the same time, we can think about also these creators. This is Philip Roth, the booker, the, the prose writer, wonderful prose writer, and this is Woody Allen, of course. Um, now, they also make, at the same time, movies and books. We're talking about a bit before, 1960s here, right? A bit before comics uh, that also deal with very Jewish themes. So what can we learn about the Jewish American uh, community from, from those two revolutions, from the first revolution that changed the comic book industry of the superhero, and then the second revolution that also changed the comic book industry of the graphic novel. Uh, and we see that this is a group that is already much more, feels much more comfortable in American society. And so it's unafraid to show and discuss aspects that are not positive, that are actually very difficult to contend with, right? Faith, religion, Holocaust, again, all of these themes touch at the core of what it means to be Jewish, but also to be a person in the modern era of whatever faith or nationality or identity you may be. Right? Uh, but what does it mean to be, to be that? to be a modern person, to be a modern Jewish person, to be an American Jewish person. Uh, and and we, can, we can see that the graphic novels are unafraid to ask those questions. And that basically we're talking about a community that, is, that feels much more comfortable. Sadly, in the past few years, that level of comfort has eroded a lot. But, uh, but in those two cultural evolutions, that is what we see. So I wanted to say thank you very much. I hope you're still here. And if you are, really, I would love to get any, uh, any questions or thoughts you may have. All right. Uh, all right, so um, I wanna say thank you very much and I hope you have as good a time as this can be. Work out, uh, get a lot of stuff from Masa, read lectures, dance, hear music, be productive as, as you can, not overly productive, just productive enough for you to feel well. And I hope uh, we'll all get to see each other healthy and well in a few weeks in whatever circumstance it may be. Thank you so much. Oh, Bella, okay. How is Vlad the Caracis? Uh, okay, so you should definitely read Mouse, uh, but in, in Mouse you can just see that, that Vladek says very racist things about um, I think it's about 
Africans and African Americans, but I'm, I'm not sure. I need to go back to the book to see these specific scenes, but it's being, it's, it's very clearly iterated that he, he says racist things and he has no problem being racist. Uh, I, I think even a bit misogynist uh, and he's not a very relatable character. All right, thank you so much and goodbye.